from NBC News. This is Today with Matt Lauer and Ann Curry. Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. Coffee yet? Here comes something exotic and expensive. It has for a lot of people. CNBC's Scott Wapner is here with a look at his new documentary, The Coffee Addiction. And it is. It, it, it absolutely is. Did you have your coffee yet today? I did. One cup. Yeah, I did as well. And I traveled to northern Peru where the altitude, heat, and humidity are just right for growing coffee to see how a coffee bean makes it all the way into your cup. It's a passion, an addiction, a shot in the arm for a nation short on sleep. There you go, have a good one. And a drink that spans generations. When you have two little kids, you drink coffee. When I get up in the morning, mommy has to have coffee. <laughs> Americans drink up to 400 million cups of coffee a day. But as you sip your morning cup of joe, you probably never give much thought to how it gets to your cup. Coffee is an amazing product. Phil Beatty thinks about it all the time as a coffee buyer outside Seattle. Most of the time I'm traveling around Central and South America, East Africa, even the South Pacific to find the very best coffees. We accompanied Beatty on his latest trip to northern Peru, through the jungle to where the coffee supply chain really begins. We'll cross this river and then begin hiking to the coffee farm. Our six-mile hike is grimy and grubby, with mud so sticky and deep, you could lose a shoe or your sanity. That was no joke. Uh, there's a the coffee right here on the trees. Coffee beans actually come from trees that take about five years to bear fruit and thrive in this jungle climate. This cherry has two coffee beans in it. One of the things I, I like to see is a, is a lot of ripe cherries at the same time. This nice deep red is, is ripe. That's when it's going to have most of the sweetness. It will take these same coffee beans two months and 4,000 miles to reach the States. A costly process for Phil Beatty. The beans he paid $2.70 a pound for in Peru go up to $3.83 after shipment. After those beans are roasted and packaged, the cost is now $7 a pound. Add in marketing and distribution costs, and he's up to $10.50. Finally, after accounting for overhead and profit, the retail price of Phil Beatty's high-quality coffee beans comes to $14.70 a pound. The stakes are very high. The competition among U.S. roasters to find the very best coffee is very tight. And if I'm not here, then I guarantee you somebody else will be to get the best coffee for their customers. Hmm. And you can see more tomorrow night on CNBC, 9 p.m. Next, discover the raw manpower, the incredible expense, and the intricate logistics behind the coffee addiction. Next, only on CNBC. It's called the social drink. The one we can't live without. The one that gets us through the day. It's booze without the booze. It's a passion, an addiction, a shot in the arm for a nation short on sleep. There you go, have a good one. And a drink that spans generations. Maxwell House, good to the last drop. The only kind I sell. Off the shelf and at the counter. Small latte and a small ice latte. More coffee is consumed in the U.S. than in any other country. 400 million cups of it every day. You know, you think a baby having a bottle or something, you know, like how that comforts you, that's how coffee feels to me. In the next hour, we'll take you inside the global coffee market, worth $80 billion, in search of the finest beans in the world. Follow us to the jungles of South America, where coffee and fortunes grow on trees. Here's the coffee right here. The stakes are very high. If I'm not here, then I guarantee you somebody else will be to get the best coffee for their customers. All coffee is grown within 1,500 miles of the equator in more than 50 countries. It's built empires and overbuilt them. In a sense, Starbucks, for whatever reason, became the poster child at the time for excess. The rise, fall, rise again of a giant at the heart of our caffeine culture.
the life is short. Read only good books, keep only good company, drink only good coffee. This is The Coffee Addiction. There was a time in America when coffee was just a drink. Please enjoy. Today, it is something more, fancier, tastier, pricier, a magic elixir that satisfies our collective cravings and our addiction to caffeine. So I find a lot of chocolate and caramel in there. Subtle hints of jasmine on the nose. And if there's any doubt that America's become a coffee nation, the proof can be found here in Houston, Texas, at the United States Barista Competition. You're going to find a natural development of flavor. The sweetness is the focus. These caffeinated connoisseurs are battling for a $5,000 cash prize and a shot at making it to the World Championship, where top honors are given for the best cup of joe on the planet. Once, slinging coffee was a job. Today, it's a calling. We're going to give people what they want because that's what coffee is about, it's an experience. Enjoy. Joshua Boyd is a barista and the owner of Metronome outside Seattle. Barista is Italian for bartender. And just like making a perfect martini, there's a lot of skill required of these ambassadors of coffee. We've been inspired by a product. We've been inspired by the world's production of this amazing thing. And honestly, we've just been taken away by that river of passion. Just as passionate is Melissa Owens, a one-time cover girl for Barista Magazine, considered the Bible for coffee enthusiasts. Owens was a pre-med student before finding her life's work and is the first to admit her devotion to coffee might be a bit extreme, right down to her tattoos. I had latte art tattoos, and I just caught the bug and became obsessed. Everything has to do with coffee or came from coffee in my life. I think as the coffee is getting better, from the producing to importing to the exporting, we as baristas can convey that message to the customer, and that's, what, um, that's why they keep coming back. Americans drink up to 400 million cups a day. And though coffee houses are the fastest growing part of the restaurant industry, 86% of us still get our morning fix at home, from top sellers like Maxwell House and Folgers, still on supermarket shelves where they've always been. Whether your coffee is store-bought or from Starbucks, the secret is in the roasting. A quality machine can cost as much as $350,000, but according to engineer Marty Curtis, it makes all the difference. Coffee roasting is an art. If you make the roaster run to where it's easy for the person roasting it to manipulate the airflow and the burners, they can do that much better job on the coffee. Don't let his wardrobe fool you. Building and fixing roasters has made Curtis a wealthy man. Most people consider me top at, at what I do. I like to build Harleys. I was building choppers back in the 80s, and then I thought, why not do that to a roaster? And so I started hot rodding the roasters. An unusual skill for sure. Curtis has traveled all over the world, perfecting his art. So much better than a glass of wine that, you know, someday I would like to see us charge the prices of a glass of wine. You want the wrinkles gone. And so that what we're trying to do is get the, the skin of it real smooth so it isn't wrinkly like the side of my face. A small latte and a small ice latte. Whether you want your coffee smooth, strong, light, or dark. It's all in the roast. In a caffeinated cup of coffee, the green coffee beans are roasted for 12 minutes or so. The longer you roast, the stronger the taste. A double stirred cappuccino and a decaf Americano, please. But for decaf, the green coffee beans are soaked in a substance to extract the caffeine before they're roasted. Once removed, the extra caffeine is sold to pharmaceutical companies or soda and energy drink makers who will use it in their products. But while taste is important, it's the caffeine that keeps us coming back. When I get up in the morning, mommy has to have coffee. <laughs> I'll fight tooth and nail to have good coffee. When you have two little kids, you drink coffee. Coffee's the uh, 
the world's favorite drug. It's the safest drug we have. Journalist Stephen Braun wrote the book on coffee and says caffeine and its physical effects is what fuels the entire coffee industry. It's a perfectly legitimate business, but if they didn't have a drug in their product, they wouldn't have a business. Would you put all of the coffee companies in that category of sure. being a drug company? They've got a good product in that they've got a drug that it's stimulating and also mildly habit forming. Therefore, you are very highly motivated to keep drinking coffee. So it's a great business to be in. Caffeine is a classified drug, and like any drug, triggers a reaction that varies from person to person. While some people swallow 10 cups a day, others get by on just one or none. And the truth is, we only think we need it. Dr. Peter Martin is a professor of psychiatry and pharmacology at Vanderbilt University's School of Medicine. One of the important distinctions between drinking coffee and an addiction is addiction is not having balance in your life. Martin has spent the last 15 years studying the effects of caffeine. Some of his funding has come from coffee companies like Nestle and Starbucks. The medical consensus points towards the caffeine fix as less of an addiction and more of a physical dependence with its own set of withdrawal symptoms, including migraines and mood alterations. If you drink coffee regularly and then one day not drink coffee, then you might develop a headache or you might really want that cup of coffee, but you're not going to rob a bank or kill your wife to get that cup of coffee. What coffee does is combats the natural urges to sleep. There are chemicals in your brain that help you stay awake and others that cause drowsiness. Adenosine is one of them and when released will make you feel tired. This is where caffeine comes in. Caffeine blocks the adenosine from doing its job, so you feel more alert and awake. Can I get a double shirt Americano, please? While a jolt of Java overrides the body's natural response, Dr. Martin says this is not a habit that needs breaking. I was taught in medical school that coffee was bad for your health. But when I started looking at the literature, one of the things that was so interesting was that not only is coffee not harmful to health, it may actually be beneficial. A Harvard School of Public Health study found long-term moderate coffee drinking could help prevent the onset of such illnesses as type 2 diabetes and Parkinson's. More reason, perhaps, to spare the guilt and have a cup. Good news for the millions of people whose life without coffee would be unbearable. But where does our coffee come from, and how does it get here? We found out. Oh, man. The hard way. Do you think people have any idea what it takes to find coffee beans, quality coffee beans? No, oh, it's, it's an amazing journey. I mean, it's not easy to find good beans. you got to go to the right spot. And later. I spent this week and I coffee with you. The coffee that conquered America, inside Starbucks. It's all about the quality. With the taster in chief. Those stories, when the coffee edition returns. <music> 7 a.m. on a Monday morning, the start of a new work week. As you sip your morning coffee, you probably never give much thought to how it gets to your cup. Coffee's an amazing product. There's so much romance involved with going out into the jungles all the way to the cafe where you have a very skilled barista making that coffee. Coffee is a great elixir that encourages social activity, it facilitates conversation. Phil Beatty thinks about coffee all the time. As a coffee buyer for Delano's, a small roaster outside Seattle, his beans are enjoyed by thousands in specialty coffee shops and grocery stores across the country. We keep about two weeks on hand, so it's about 120,000 pounds of coffee. It's a job that requires many months away from home in faraway places. Most of the time I'm traveling around Central and South America, East Africa, even the South Pacific, to find the very best coffees. When you look at a bag of coffee from some far off place and you realize everything that was involved in getting it here, what do you think about? 
You know, for me, this, this coffee, this bag, gives me a great, deep sense of responsibility. But there are so many people and so many hands that have influenced this coffee and how it got to me. We wanted to see for ourselves where the supply chain begins, how coffee beans grown thousands of miles away eventually become your morning fix. We followed Beatty to northern Peru, over the Andes Mountains, home to some of the world's highest quality beans. The 11-hour plane ride turned out to be the easiest part of our trip. We land 500 miles north of Lima, in Tarapoto, the gateway to Peru's Amazon Basin. Finally in Tarapoto. A place where just getting around can be an adventure. The first time I went to Origin to see coffee being harvested and grown, I was blown away. This is a long way from Washington State. It's definitely a change of scenery, change of culture. For Beatty, it's just another day on the job. He travels 150,000 miles a year in search of the best coffee beans money can buy. This is where our journey really begins. We'll cross this river and then begin hiking to the coffee farm. Here we are on a tributary of the Amazon going off to find our trail up into the mountains. We gotta go to the right spot. Easier said than done. Across the river, we meet the men who will guide us on our trek. Guzman, quiero presentarle a Scott Wapner. Senor Guzman, mucho gusto. Nice to meet you. It's a pleasure. We look forward to going to your farm. Guzman Inga Julica is 47 years old, a second generation coffee farmer. It's his beans that Phil Beatty came all this way to buy. You got everything? The trail into Peru's coffee-growing region is treacherous with hidden dangers. The land is controlled by locals who rarely encounter Americans, let alone ones with cameras. Our guides are not taking chances. Our hike to Guzman's coffee farm is gritty, grimy, and grubby. Six miles, sweat-soaked slog through streams, and mud so sticky and deep you could lose a shoe or your sanity. Oh man, that was no joke. You could sit in the office, you could sit on your couch, use the internet now to order coffee from anywhere in the world. Why do you come all the way out here? It's really crucial to show that farmer that I care. It gives them validation and it lets me make sure that when I pay a really high price for a high quality coffee that that money is making it back to the person who in the end is responsible for creating that quality. Not all of the coffee Phil Beatty buys is this hard to get to, but he believes in some cases the story of the farmer and the provenance of the beans can be a great marketing tool. Here's the coffee right here on the trees. Coffee beans actually come from trees that take about five years to bear fruit and thrive in this jungle climate. Robusta beans are grown at lower altitude, but here, the high altitude, sweltering humidity, ideal shade, and rich soil are a perfect blend for growing the superior Arabica beans that Beatty's come for. Peru is a major supplier, but in Brazil, which grows 40% of the world's coffee, harvesting is beginning to look like this high-tech and automated, while farmers everywhere else pick by hand. The stakes are very high. The competition among U.S. roasters to find the very best coffee is, is very tight. And, and if I'm not here, then I guarantee you somebody else will be to get the best coffee for their customer. The stakes are also high for Guzman and his family. A sale could improve their lives for years to come. I never dreamed that a roaster will come all the way up here to see my little farm. After more than four hours on the trail, we arrive in darkness at Guzman's farm. 
When I came here in October, I knew that there was something here that could be very special. This is Phil Beatty's second visit here. He had come seven months earlier, liked what he saw, and secured a deal for this year's harvest. Guzman and his family moved here five years ago and built this two-story structure with no door or indoor plumbing. They wash in this makeshift shower, use this crudely built outhouse, and sleep here. Today, they claim about 60 acres of land and pay their handful of workers about $12 a day. In a good year, the Guzmans can make as much as 20,000 soles, about $6,500. It may not sound like a lot, but in Peru, where the minimum wage is $185 a month, six grand goes a long way. How has the coffee business improved your family's life? We now have some money left at the end of the crop year. Yeah, it's not like it used to be, when at the end of the year, we had nothing left in our pockets. It makes me very proud that I have a quality product. It only motivates me to keep working at it and expand my production. Beatty didn't know for sure what he was getting until now. It looks pretty good. This particular tree is loaded down and got a lot of ripe cherries on it. This cherry has two coffee beans in it. One of the things I, I like to see is a, is a lot of ripe cherries at the same time. These dark red ones? Yeah, this, this nice deep red is, is ripe. That's when it's going to have most of the sweetness. If you have any of these green cherries, these are going to give a really sour taste to the coffee. Guzman, es, es un gusto verte. Igual manera, yo también. An entire tree produces only about a pound and a half of coffee a year. The beans are actually inside these cherries. The hundreds of pounds of cherries are hauled down the mountain. A team of workers then cleans them, removes the pulp, and washes the beans by hand. A lot of work goes into the process of coffee. It's very important to the taste. Washing prevents the cherries and ultimately the coffee from smelling like dirt. They're now fermented and spread out to dry by Guzman's son. There are still two months and 4,000 miles to go before these beans make it into a cup and become part of the $80 billion global coffee industry. Later, we'll follow those beans all the way back to the U.S. Cheers. Cheers. And taste the result. But first, from the jungles of Peru to the jungles of Manhattan. Coming up, we go inside Starbucks. I like to explain it as the high def coffee. The company that tasted success and didn't know when to say when. One day, there was a feeling within the company that we were invincible that we could do anything. The king of coffee, when we return. Alex can help you right over at the second register. With more than 17,000 stores, coffee prep, you want a light? And 50 million customers a week, Starbucks has become an American fixture. It's made a fortune catering to a nation that needs its caffeine. It needs it now. Starbucks has transformed a commodity that once cost a buck into something more expensive and exotic. Grande caramel frappuccino. From a grande frappuccino to a 24-ounce caramel macchiato, there are 170,000 drink combinations in all, and something to satisfy every individual taste. Thank you. You have a good one. But who picks those flavors? Who makes sure that the Starbucks house blend tastes the same in Phoenix as it does in Philly? The answer can be found here on the eighth floor, deep inside Starbucks Seattle headquarters. This is the man with the golden palate. His name is Dub Hay, Starbucks director of coffee. Millions of coffee addicts put their money where his mouth is. How many cups do you do? A day. This room will do about 800 cups of coffee. Sniffing, slurping, 
sloshing, and spitting, hay detects subtle differences in the aroma, acidity, body, and flavor of more than 30 blends from 40 countries. Why do you have to taste it like that? So that you spray it evenly across your palate. This tastes like coffee to me. Well, what do you taste? This, well, so this is a very intense cup of coffee, and it's done that way on purpose because we're looking to see the character of the coffee. You Hay has many words to describe coffee, and one he tries to avoid. Some people say Starbucks coffee tastes bitter. Mm -hmm. Does that make you angry? Yeah. It does? Yeah, it does, because bitterness is not inherent in coffee. But you've heard that before. I have heard that before. Uh, I don't accept it, but I've heard it. I think they're just drinking their own Starbucks coffee. They should go to a lighter coffee if they think it's too bitter. What was once just a passion for coffee has turned into something approaching religion. Its leading evangelist is Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz. You still energized to come to work every day? More than ever, honestly, really, more than ever. Schultz helped make coffee cool by making Starbucks a destination, a third place, as he calls it, between home and work. Today, he's the company's most unapologetic cheerleader. The courage to make a decision. When you see somebody, though, walk down the street with a cup of coffee from one of your competitors... I'm not happy. You take it personally. I do take it personally because I take the company personally and I think our people do. Schultz first joined Starbucks as a marketing whiz from New York in 1982. Five years later, he was CEO and chairman. One day, there was a feeling within the company, within the organization, that we were invincible, that we could do anything. What happened next was a textbook case of corporate overreaching. Schultz built thousands of new stores, and when he was done, he built thousands more. In Manhattan alone, there are 182 Starbucks within a seven-mile radius. They didn't seem to know where the top was. They kept hitting their goals and realizing that the stores were still extremely profitable and that they could put them really close together and still have profitable stores. So Business reporter Melissa Allison covers Starbucks for the Seattle Times. They were trying to make coffee available in as many places as they could. So you could literally have a Starbucks here and then you may have one across the street and then a block down you could have another one. Absolutely. As the company got bigger and bigger so did the corporate ego. Schultz stepped aside in 2000, but remained as the full-time, very involved chairman, a period he describes in his recent memoir, Onward. Let me read you something you say in the book. Okay. As the years passed, enthusiasm morphed into a sense of entitlement. Confidence became arrogance. So there was yeah. arrogance around here. Yeah. You thought that yeah. everything you did was going to be gold until well, it wasn't. To a degree, that's true. You have to remember, though, even at the point of uh, 2007 and 2008, more than 50 million people a week were still going into our stores. There isn't a retailer in history that has ever done that before, and we did it while we were self-cannibalizing about 30% of our stores because we were opening stores in close proximity. And then if I go here, there's a Starbucks there. As the stores multiplied, with dueling Starbucks on top of each other, a pop culture backlash took hold. The entire town of scenic South Dakota is for sale for $799,000. You buy the whole city, 12 acres, has a saloon, a post office, and 15 Starbucks. Yeah, it's a pretty good deal. Wow. Amazing. In a sense, Starbucks, for whatever reason, became the poster child at the time for excess. Could you sense that there was growing concern inside the company? There was a sense that it was just a hiccup, that it was this little thing that they were going to fix and everything was going to be fine after that. Uh, shares of Starbucks down 37% in the last year. But this was more than a hiccup. In January 2008, Schultz returned as CEO and took drastic measures.